Highland, Illinois, Gustav Palmquist, a distinguished-looking man in his 40s, called to order the first annual meeting of Swedish Baptists in America. From Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois, they had come for the urgent business of uniting pioneer Swedish Baptist churches. Seven men who were to make decisions that would reach into the next century. Love for Christ compelled them to reach out to their pioneer neighbors with the redeeming message of the gospel. Among the delegates was Frederick O. Nilsson, who with Palmquist and Anders Weberg had brought the Swedish Baptist churches to this historic time. In Sweden, the Conventicles Edict of 1726 had made private religious services illegal. But by the 1840s, Bible reading groups began in secret and revival quietly took hold. Baptisms took place at night to prevent discovery. Men and women went to prison for their beliefs. For them, a light had dawned and they could never again walk in darkness. On New Year's night, 1850, an armed mob burst into a home worship. Cursing and kicking, they attacked the believers and hauled the preacher, Frederick O. Nielsen, off to jail. His trial dragged on until April when the verdict came, guilty. And the sentence? Perpetual banishment from Sweden. During his appeal, Nilsson first met Palmquist and Weaver, a meeting with far-reaching effects. Palmquist, a former school teacher and evangelist in Stockholm, was soon on his way to America with a group seeking religious freedom. Visiting Swedish settlements, he attended a Baptist revival meeting one night. As he listened, he recalled Nielsen's suffering for his Baptist belief. Suddenly, Palmquist knew he must be baptized. A few weeks after his own baptism, he immersed three men and a woman in the muddy Mississippi at Rock Island, Illinois, and five days later, organized the first Swedish Baptist church in America. Almost at the same time, Anders Weberg stopped at Copenhagen to be baptized by the exiled Nilsson. Weberg had been ordained a Lutheran minister in 1842, but met with opposition and threats of suspension because of his evangelism. Weberg's preaching turned people insane, fellow preachers criticized. Disillusioned, Weberg resigned from his church and for two years lived in poverty and distress. A providential meeting with German Baptists impressed him with their lives, but not their doctrine. Intending to refute their position of immersion, he produced a biblical study which instead fully supported it. His book, Who Should Be Baptized and What Is Baptism, was published in 1852. By the next year, Nilsson, Palmquist, and Weberg were working together in America. Swedish settlements were growing on the American frontier. Typical was Houston, Minnesota, begun in 1853 by six families who had traveled from Sweden with Nilsson. Going by steamer to La Crosse, Wisconsin, they then trekked along the Root River 20 miles west, carrying their small children and all their possessions. They rested under the stars that warm August and sang praises to God in perfect liberty. By winter's end, a prairie fire would sweep through their settlement and nearly a third of the group would perish from cholera. We were like one family, the whole settlement. We were all of one accord and had such a good time, even in all our poverty. What one family had, we all had. I shall never forget those days. Pioneer preachers walked almost impassable paths, wading through thick mud and swamps, and in the winter, cutting through as much as three feet of ice for baptisms. The Infant Swedish Baptist Conference strengthened the pioneer churches, but immense distances and hazardous travel made annual meetings almost impossible. State conferences began to form instead, and the larger conference ceased meeting. In 1870, 
when John Alexis Edwin came to pastor the first Swedish Baptist Church in Chicago, the new Homestead Act and the cross-country railroad were bringing Swedish immigrants by the thousands. Seeing all this, and feeling how great an advantage it would be for our missionaries and pastors to have a theological training, I was seized with a burning desire to impart to others what I myself had learned. In May 1871, Edgren began a Swedish publication, and in the fall, opened a seminary on the Baptist Union Theological Seminary campus with one student, Christopher Selene. A month later, Chicago burned. Before dawn came, Edgren's church and publication were destroyed. Broken in health, he sailed alone for Sweden to rest returning in 1873 to find that his young daughter had died and his wife was living in poverty. The situation appeared intolerable, but I had to bear it. He resumed teaching at the seminary and began a new publication. Both were soon threatened with closure because of the country's depression. Friends of the school responded, Dr. Cooley offering a calf worth $40 and Captain William Wilson giving $400. The publication was lost, but in 1877, Edgren began yet another, Evangelical Journal. Later renamed the New Weekly Mail, it was to survive 41 years merging with the Swedish Standard in 1918. At Village Creek, Iowa, in 1879, 20 delegates resumed the annual meetings of the Swedish Baptist Conference. Their immediate urgent business was to rally help for Edwin, appointing a school board and supporting the publication. The following year, the conference appointed its first home missionary, Christopher Selene. Edgren's first student, paying him $800 a year. Eight years later, in 1888, Johanna Anderson, the first conference foreign missionary, sailed for Burma under the auspices of American Baptists. Slowly, the Swedish Baptist Conference outreach grew. And by the 1902 Golden Jubilee in Chicago, 22,000 members made up the conference. The inspiration of that great gathering resulted in new social ministries, another school, and outreach to Canada within the next five years. In 1905, Bethel Academy, a high school, opened at Elam Baptist Church in Minneapolis, moving to its own site in Minneapolis in 1907. It later located with Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, eventually becoming Bethel College. At New Britain, Connecticut, a policeman found three small abandoned boys and told J.E. Klingberg, a conference pastor, who took them into his home. Soon Klingberg rented a house and began caring for homeless children, a ministry that would grow to reach hundreds of children and include five homes. At the same time, Eric Bozane, at every annual meeting, persisted in his vision for homes for the aged. Work began when Dr. and Mrs. N.P. Walters of Evanston, Illinois, gave $1,000 as a memorial to their late son. The Freedom Home opened in Chicago in 1905, followed by Sunset Home in Kansas, Elam Park in Connecticut, Verdugo in California, Mounds Park Sanitarium, School of Nursing, and Midway Hospital in St. Paul. The first conference missionary to Canada, Fred Tomberg, began work in 1905, and a year later, the Alberta Conference was organized. In time, the Canadian districts would contribute a remarkably high number of foreign missionaries. The next three years saw great strides in the conference literary ministry. In 1909, the conference purchased the Swedish publishing department from American Baptists and opened a bookstore in Chicago's Loop. A year later, it acquired a publication edited by Arvid Gord, principal of Bethel Academy. The publication was renamed The Swedish Standard, and eight years later was merged with the new weekly mail 
begun by Edgren. Delegates to the 1912 annual meeting in Chicago faced a crucial decision about the Scandinavian seminary. It must either relocate or cease to exist. Was there still a need for a Swedish seminary or even a Swedish conference? By the next annual meeting, God's will was abundantly clear. A wider, more inclusive ministry was before the conference. The seminary was moved to St. Paul, locating with Bethel Academy. G. Arvid Hagstrom was elected president of the combined schools, with C. G. Lagergren, dean of the seminary, and A. J. Wingblade, principal of the academy. By 1916, the seminary was conducting some classes in English. Other changes soon followed. As early as 1890, Eric Wingren, editor of the New Weekly Mail, had advocated independent foreign missions. And in 1914, the publication began soliciting support for G.T. Whitman, missionary to Spain. A foreign missions committee in 1917 assumed this responsibility and in 1923 became the Swedish Baptist Foreign Mission Society, a formal part of the conference supporting a Russian ministry. Later, conference young people rallied to support Edna and Reuben Holm in the sand. A controversy among American Baptists, under whom conference missionaries were sent, accelerated the conference foreign missions program. Some individuals, churches, and districts agitated for a fully independent conference program. Others, less optimistic, said the mission of Swedish Baptist was finished. On a warm day in June in 1944, nearly 500 delegates met for the annual meeting in St. Paul. As sessions passed without progress on the foreign missions question, delegates gathered in prayer and discussion groups. When the emotional debate was over, the conference was united in a new advance with the decision to have its own foreign missions program. Goals were set for 52 missionaries by 52, the conference centennial year, and $50,000 for foreign missions by Easter of 1945. The pattern which is being woven before our eyes is unmistakably of divine origin. In that design, we see reminders of the past, the faithful endeavors of our godly parents. Walfred Danielson was called as secretary for the new board. Formerly a missionary to Assam, Bethel Dean, and associate secretary for the American Baptists, he was uniquely suited for the task. It is a new day for General Conference Baptists who under the guidance of the Spirit of God find themselves united in friendly cooperation with others. And so it was a new day. The appeal for funds topped $80,000, and by 1945, the first missionary in the new program, Sten Lindbergh, was on his way to China. Five mission fields were opened in six years, and the goal for 52 missionaries was reached two years early. In 1945, William Turnwall relieved R.A. Arlander as Home Missions Secretary, beginning a 15-year term that was to see the conference double and Turnwall's dream fulfilled, a church planter in every district. the conference was averaging 14 new churches per year, one every 26 days. Fastest growing was California with nine churches in 1944 and 99 in 1970 through the dynamic leadership of men like Arthur Christensen. Today, the conference, now grown to more than 700 churches in 16 districts, two schools and eight mission fields, is touching lives through ever-widening circles of love and concern. 
Four dedicated men, Nilsen, Palmquist, Weberg, and Edgren, were led of God to pioneer the Swedish Baptist Conference. And in the crisis hours, Hagstrom, Arlander, Turnwall, Danielson, Wingblade, and a host of other men and women were God's instruments for change. Yesterday's dreams live on, with God's will more clearly seen as each new step is taken in faith. The pattern is God's, a dynamic fellowship of churches reaching out to the world with our Savior's love, the Baptist General Conference.